If you would open your Bible to the book of Psalms, we'll be reading from Psalm 139 in just a second. Grateful for your presence this morning and those of you visiting with us, we're grateful to have you as well and hope that you'll be encouraged as we study together from the Word of God. If I were to ask you, who knows you the best? Do you have someone who comes to your mind? Maybe it's your spouse, maybe it's your parents, it might even be your kids. Maybe it's your brother or your sister, and many of you might say, well, my best friend knows me the best. But who is it that knows you the best when you're the worst? Of course, I know none of us in this room are ever at our worst. And what do we think of when we try to talk about our worst? Do we happily, with no masks, show before other people who we are at our worst? The people who know you the best probably have known you the longest. But the people who really know you the best are the people who you let see you. In our psalm for today, and the psalm of this week's reading, the psalmist talks about how deeply it is that God knows him. He talks about how God knows him by sharing with us the conversation he has with God. And truthfully, that is how someone like your brother, your sister, your mom or your dad or your children or your friend or your best friend knows you is because they have been able to see you by what you say, not just by what you think. And he talks about how God knowing what he is going to do and how he knows how God feels about him is something that he'll say is something that is Too wonderful for me. But at the same time, we'll say it's something that's very convicting. Because God has Googled you. God knows you. Just like God knows me. If you want to find out something about someone today, you Google them, right? It's become its own little word, Googling But many of us don't want anyone to Google us. And years ago when I first started preaching, someone told me, yeah, they'll definitely get to know you, Don. You're going to tell stories about Tracy. You're going to tell stories about your kids. And they'll get to know you. Even Frank Walton told me a long time ago that he would pay his kids 25 cents every time he told a story on them. I didn't have enough money, so. But the truth is, God knows us. He knows us better than we know ourselves. And I'm a pretty introverted kind of person, so that's kind of terrifying to me to let everyone know all about me. But with God, I am and you are truly known. No one needs to share with him what they know about you. None of us need to bother with changing the lens filter on the camera of our life. God knows us better. And God still wants to be with us. It's not like Instagram. It's not even like Facebook. Where, of course, we select what we put out there. But then you add to the reality that in Instagram that you can choose the filter to change the ambiance of the picture. I'm looking forward to one day them creating a filter that puts hair on my head when they take my picture. No one thinks that that's funny when I tell the photographer that. Tracy cringes with the very thought of it. But in Instagram, the more followers you have, 
the better. Because if you have more followers than you're following, then that means you're really cool. Well, I'm not cool. And the truth is, is that even a professional Instagrammer can make money off of their Instagram pics. In fact, people are hired when they have so many followers. I think it's something like 400 or 500,000 uh, followers. That uh, When you get to this level of following, then businesses who are savvy will say, well, we're going to hire you to visit our company. And when you Instagram your pictures with us, we'll pay you money. Something like three or $4,000. For one picture that reaches a certain level of followers. Again, not only am I not that cool, but if you follow me, it only takes 499,511 more people to make me capable of earning that extra money. But what you see in those photos aren't usually real. We fake life. But we can't fake God. God sees behind the image and he can see our soul. He's not distracted by the glamour. He's unconcerned with our followers. And the psalmist reminds us again and again that to be known by God is the very best thing. It's not the worst. It's a blessing. Read with me Psalm 139. O Lord, Thou hast searched me and known me. Thou dost know when I sit down and when I rise up. Thou dost understand my thought from afar. Thou dost scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, Thou dost know it all. Thou hast enclosed me behind and before and laid Thy hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high, I cannot attain to it. Where can I go from thy spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell by the remotest part of the sea, even there thy hand will lead me and thy right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me, and the light around me will be nigh, even the darkness is not dark to you. And the night is as bright as the day, darkness and light are alike to you. For you did form my inward parts. Thou didst weave me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are, my, are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth, your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in thy book they were all written, the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I could count them, they would outnumber the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Oh, that thou wouldst slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, men of bloodshed, for they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with the utmost hatred. They have become my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts, and see if there be any hurtful way in me, and lead me in the everlasting way. You know, the psalmist begins this verse with, or this song with, or prayer, O Lord, You've examined me. You know, you know everything about me. And notice as he begins the psalm by, by making this statement, it is not a, a, a confession of the fear that he has about God. It is not a confession of how terrified he is of being in the presence of God or how 
awful and how horrible it is to live a life exposed to God. It is for him, verse 6, too wonderful. But yet we look at our own personal lives and we see it in the lives of people in Scripture like Adam and Eve as a perfect example. When they become sinners, have transgressed what God asked them to do, they hide from him. Then there's Jonah. We know the story of Jonah. That his own pride and his own hatred for the ones that God had sent him to preach to, the Ninevites, made him run from God. But God found him just like God found Adam and Eve. And then there's reality in the life of Saul of Tarsus, who on the road to Damascus, as he's marching there with the entourage from those from the Sanhedrin to bring to court to those people who were followers of this Jesus of Nazareth. And the Lord met him on the way, told him what he would do. He would need to go into Damascus and it would be shown him what he would do. And Saul of Tarsus yielded to what the Lord had shown him. Saul of Tarsus is a little different than Adam and Eve and Jonah because when confronted with what God wanted him to do, he yielded. But the reason he yielded is because Saul of Tarsus realized he had been running away from what the Messiah had been announced to be. He had to yield to what it was God wanted for Saul's life, because the life that the Messiah had lived was the will that God had given the Messiah. So then the psalmist says, Lord, test me, see me, and lead me. To surrender your life to where God wants you to be is this process that we see in the life of Saul of Tarsus unfolding into the Apostle Paul. It is the life that we see of David in Psalm 139 that we see in the life of David unfolded over and over and over again. And the greatest truth in which we live today is to really become known. We, we talk about that all, time, all the time, about a relationship that, that you enter a relationship, whether it's a friendship or it's a marriage, that, that we unfold ourselves little bit by little bit by little bit until we finally become fully known to this person that we are extending our love to and that we are wanting to be loved by. It's no different when we come happily to God. That we witness before our flight, that we are fleeing from God, that we have finally come to the light of His presence to recognize that the light of Him shining upon the darkness of our soul is the most illuminating and warming experience so that David would say in verse 17, How precious are your thoughts to me, O God. It's coming to know Him that we finally come to know ourselves. In the blinding light of His true holiness, we instantly recognize the shallowness of our own lives. And the psalm is not generic. It's not written about a whole bunch of people. It's about David and God. And especially God. You can break up the psalm, and my, my psalm uh, is within the reading is broken up into more, but it's, but it's really broken up into four sections. So when you look at the first six verses, he's saying, God, you know me, and I can't escape that. God knows absolutely everything about me. He knows my actions. He knows when I sit down. He knows when I get up. He knows everywhere I go. He knows when I lie down. He's intimately acquainted with my ways. Such knowledge, he says, as we said, is too wonderful for me. Do you know yourself yet? It's a funny process, this process of living. 
when you're 18, your parents don't understand you. When you're 21 or 22 and you finish, if you happen to be in college and you finish college, then in your early 20s, you, you go through an experience of life where you start to understand that you didn't know yourself as well as you thought you did. You're surprised at the things that you do. And then you get into your 30s and maybe if you're parenting, then you start to see, wow, man, I really can't believe that was what I, man, I can't believe I just did that. And I'm in my 50s and I'm still waiting for the moment that I'm going to stop being surprised about how foolish I am. But isn't that what life's journey is about is becoming truly acquainted with who you really are. When you expose yourself to the light of God, he allows you to see. And I think David's point is, it's too wonderful for me, I cannot even attain it. It's not that I can't know what you know. That's not, I don't think, David's point. It's that God, here I am in all of my darkness before your great and marvelous light, and here I am still standing. I see the darkness that is in me, and here before your presence, you are allowing me to continue to stand. It is a true revelation of the great mercy that God manifests to us. It, it, is, it is a great mercy of the grace that God showers upon us that I can't escape what God really knows about me. But the point is, God still wants to know you. So then he says in verse 7 through 12. Now that God you know me so well. I know I can't escape from your presence. And as illustrated Jonah becomes that perfect example. We know that Jonah ran because of his pride. And really because of his prejudiced view of what he thought of the Assyrians. And isn't that really the reason that we flee from God. Why Adam and Eve fled from God is because they really didn't know God. They were fearful. Oh, they fled because they were afraid of God. They had not seen or witnessed any judgment of God that showed his wrath in that moment. They had not witnessed God execute wrath and judgment upon any sin because sin had not occurred. Why did they flee? Because they did not understand God. They did not know what would happen. Once the cross has been planted firmly in your vision and you know in your heart exactly what the presence of the cross truly means, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life, then why is it that we flee? David says, I can't escape your presence. If I go to heaven, you're there. If I go down to Sheol, you're there. If I take the wings of the dove, it doesn't matter where I go. And it doesn't matter even if I flee into darkness, your light will still be there. I don't believe David is afraid. I think David is amazed. Have you ever said anything to your parent that you were embarrassed about? I'll tell you a little story about my mom. She was a very quiet person who usually when things came out of her mouth, the whole world stood still because <laughs> there wasn't many times that she said much. And... I remember once driving in the car with her, being a teenager in high school, the language that uh, teenagers you simply use are a little bit more earthier than the language of sophisticated adults. And it probably reflects my mom's upbringing and it might reflect my mom's own personal sensitivities. If I told you the word that I said, I'm, I probably should tell you because you're gonna think it was an awful word, but we were talking And I was, I used the word jock. And my mom blushed 
in the car. And I remember thinking, Mom, why'd you blush? And then I thought, oh, I know why you blushed. But in the presence of being with my mom in that moment, realizing I had embarrassed her, it didn't stop me from going back to her and apologizing. And in fact, it made me want to yearn and still does want to yearn for being able to share with her whenever I need to be understood. And I think David's point is exactly the same. I don't think he's saying is that, that I want to run away from you. He says, I understand that I cannot run from you. I, I always want to be there in your presence because their darkness and like, light are alike to you. And then he says in verses 13 through 18, I see who you are. Even in the darkness of the womb, you knew who I was. Even in the darkness of that experience of being away from you before my eyes had ever opened, before I could ever see anything around me, you had seen me. Verse 17, how amazing are even your thoughts to me. I can't escape God's power and sovereignty. God sees behind and sees everything because of the sovereign rule that he has. No matter the darkness that surrounds your life, God can see who you are. There's a statement that Augustine said a long time ago. He says, men go abroad to wonder at the heights of mountains, at the huge waves of the sea. At the long courses of rivers and the vast compass of the ocean and even at the circular motions of the stars. And yet they pass by themselves without wondering. Then I don't think the point of David's statement in verse 13 is the extraordinariness of birth. That within the body of a woman is grown a life by the power and miracle, if you will, if you like to use that word. But I think David's point is really more the reality. That every part of our world that we experience is touched by the power and the sovereignty of a God who created us. And there David says that even as I was... Shaping, being shaped and formed in the the life of my mother. I was alive before you. And you saw me. How incredible that is. That when I am awake, I am still with you. Verse 18. I am still with you. So then he says in verse 19. When I realize I can't escape your knowledge, I can't escape your presence, I can't escape the true sovereign nature of you, your omnipresence and omnipotence, then I must surrender myself to your holiness. And in verse 19 to verse 22 are words of of strong statement. Which I think in some senses is what David recognizes is that because now that he is aware of who God is and his uh, um, omni-knowledge, his all-knowing, there's a word I want to say, his all-presence and his all-power, is that God is all-holy. And that holiness must transcend the darkness of my own life. It's inescapable. The conclusion that I must reach is that as I look around at the wicked around me, 
I will be struck with saying words like, I hate them with the utmost hatred. Because they become my enemies. David wants us to live separated from the wicked. Because God wants us to live separated from the wicked. But this statement of hating them with the utmost hatred must be likened to how it is that God would hate the wicked with an utmost hatred. Notice God in his hate of what is wicked is that he manifests love for those who are wicked. Do you understand? One writer said, to love all men with benevolence is our duty, but to love the wicked man with complacency is a crime. To hate a man for his own sake or any evil done to us would be wrong. But to hate a man because he is the foe of all goodness and the enemy of all righteousness is nothing more or less than an obligation. The more we love God, the more indignant shall we grow with those who refuse him their affection. Along the same lines, another man wrote, If there is such a thing as perfect hatred, it would mirror and reflect the righteousness of God. It would be perfect to the extent that it excluded sinful attitudes of malice, envy, bitterness, and other attitudes we normally associate with human hatred. In this sense, a perfect hatred could be deemed compatible with a love for one's enemies. One who hates his enemy with a perfect hatred is still called to act in a loving and righteous manner toward him. And I would add, because that's exactly how God has acted. Jude says in verse 23, have mercy on some who are doubting. Save others, snatching them out of the fire. And on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. When reflecting that God knows all, that God is all present, and that God has all power, the wickedness of the wicked becomes self-evident in the experience that David prays. And he says, Lord, may I hate them like you do. But notice, in living disconnected from the wicked, David prays to live connected to God by saying those two words. Now search me. When you watch those words come out of your mouth and, and your condemnation of the wicked around you, recognize in that moment that within your own life there is still plenty of sin. We use that illustration, you know, one finger pointed at you and there's at least three pointing back at me. So David's response is, so search me, O God. And know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be in me. He uses the language in the American Standard any hurtful way, but the idea is anything that is wicked. And lead me in the everlasting way. That wasn't self righteousness, that wasn't David acting, looking down the nose that he had some philosophically way of, of looking down at everyone else who's, who's inferior to him. It's, it's recognizing that now that I understand that I am in the presence of God and this is all that God is, that I will despise the things that God despises and despise them in myself. John Calvin wrote, it is certain that man never achieves, achieves a clear knowledge of himself unless he has first looked upon God's face and then descends from contemplating him to scrutinize himself. That's what David says here. That God, when I look upon you, 
and know you. I know you know me. Everywhere you are, every power that you have, every thought that you've revealed shows me again and again how much you must love me. Because even though he knows you, he loves you. Even though he knows you, he saves you. Even though he knows you, he wants you for eternity. So make these words your memory this week. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. And see if there be any harmful, hurtful way in me. And lead me in the everlasting way. If you're subject to heaven's call, we plead with you to come as we sing this song, encouraging you, if you believe and are willing to repent, to be baptized this morning. And if as a Christian you need prayers, come and let us know your need. As together we stand and as we sing.